Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Church, a place where everybody belongs. Turn to the person near you and say you belong here today. A place where everybody belongs, has an opportunity to believe the gospel and to become like Jesus. We are so glad that you are here today as we worship the Lord. Uh, let me share with you a few announcements today. The, red, uh, the ushers are passing out the red pads. Please fill in all of your information across the line and then make sure that gets all the way down the pew. Thank you very much. Also pray for our youth mission trip. That's July 16th through the 22nd. Details for that are in the bulletin. We thank you for all of your support for that uh, so far. Also, the soup kitchen serves this Tuesday. Continue to pray for Vacation Bible School. That's July 10th to July 14th. Uh, there are registration forms in the bulletin. They look like this and registration form, same form on the information table. It looks like that. So those are the two colors you're looking for. Get your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids and your great 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 grandkids signed up for the Vacation Bible School. Also, next week we're going to be picking up some some of the uh, Vacation Bible School material from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Beechwood. So if you uh, want to be a big help on that, one o'clock at St. Paul's in Beechwood next Sunday, one o'clock in the afternoon, you can help us take that over. Many hands make light work. We thank you for that. Also, if you have any questions about giving, you can go to our website, fumctr.com, click on the donate button and follow the directions. You may also mail in your gift to the church, uh, 129 Chestnut Street in Tom's River, and we thank you for your support in these times. And also the flowers on the communion table are given today to the glory of God. So with all that in our mind and some of those things in our hearts, let's stand together as the people of God for the call to worship found in Psalm 46, beginning in verse 10. The sons of Korah wrote, God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. My friends, as we gather for worship today, this is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing and let's sing number 731, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
And let's continue in worship by the prayer of confession, which is printed in your bulletin. As the people of God, let's pray together. O oh Lord, we come in humility, confessing who and what we are. We are often unresponsive because we are afraid. When your spirit speaks, we turn deaf ears, for we fear what you might call us to do. When your spirit touches our lips, we close our mouths, embarrassed to speak your word. When the wind of your spirit blows, we close the windows of our hearts, afraid the breeze will disrupt our ordered lives. When the fire of your spirit touches us, we quench the flame, afraid of the new life it might bring. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Touch our hearts deeply as we exchange fear for the presence of your spirit, who is always with us. Let's continue in silence. God reminds us of his goodness in the Gospel of John when Jesus tells us, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. For in this eternal truth we find the forgiveness the world cannot offer. Thank you, mighty God, for confirming forgiveness in us through your Son, Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Please stand once again as we continue in worship with our responsive reading printed in your bulletin. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. O Lord, you are clothed with splendor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as if it were clothing. You make the clouds your chariot and ride on the wings of the wind. Let us praise the God who created us and loves us.
Amen. Please be seated. I want to ask the Luna's family to come forward. Today we are celebrating the sacrament of baptism. Luna's family has gotten, come on over here, has gotten really active at our 9 o'clock service. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in your grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, to give reverent dependence upon the private and public worship of God, in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. We nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by her teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and lead a Christian life. Luna Nina, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mighty God, we thank you for this child, that one day she'll know you for herself, because she watched mom and dad follow you. We pray for this family, bless them and keep them close, and we'll thank you forever in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Come on over. Jenny, you want to come on over? You don't have to if you don't want to. Okay, that's fine. You want to come over? Well, one of you get on my left and one of you get on my right. You'll be my Secret Service agent, okay? <laughs> All right, we're going to walk down the aisle. I have a question for you, and the response is in your bulletin. Would you please stand? Do you, as Christ's body of the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this family now before you in your care? With God's help. Amen. Let's show this family our support today. And now, as the people of God, let's take a moment and turn and greet one another today.
It is good to be together as the people of God. As we prepare to go to prayer, please continue to keep in mind uh, all those who are listed on our prayer, our bulletin prayer list. That's a pretty update, pretty updated list. Also pray for our brothers and sisters struggling with the after effects and losses from those massive tornadoes as well as those other natural disasters. Pray for the Ukraine and Russia situation. Nobody seems to be know, go, seems to know what's going on there. And also pray for all those affected by that tragedy at sea where over 600 asylum seekers died when their fishing trawler sunk off the coast of Greece. And please remember our thought for the month from the great evangelist Billy Graham. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and our job to love. Let's always be sure we understand that correct division of labor. Now let's bow our heads and talk to God. Good morning, Abba Father. Lord, for all we sense and learn and experience, we thank you for the gift of rest and renewal, for the ebb and flow of each season, for the discoveries and delights you gift to us, we praise you. During these different days of summer, help us to take some time to relax under the canopy of your holy presence. Help us to create space for your work to break through, to create time, to be still, to pray, to listen, to rejoice. For Lord, that's part of discipleship as well. Mightiest God of all life, as we rest in you, we lift up the things that trouble our minds today. In our daily lives, soften our hearts that we might release our most difficult relationships into your care, neither trying to control the outcome nor hardening ourselves to your guiding hand. We know people who are dealing with illness and grief and are in need of your healing presence. Some of us are frightened by what we imagine the future might hold. Some are dealing with the instability of health or financial burdens. Some know the disquiet that comes with failure and disappointment. Some are now dealing with the latest shooting or tornado or other unnamed tragedy and don't know where to turn. Lord, there are many around us who are so overwhelmed by life that they cannot even imagine that you care. So Abba, Father, please plant the seed of hope in their hearts that life can and will be different with your grace. For all these people and for all these personal situations that are beyond the description of our words, we lift our hearts to you. So Lord, let us be, as one author described, wounded healers in our community. That is, people who have been hurt by the world, yet healed by you, and look to share that healing with as many as we can. For we pray all these things in the name of the one who showed us a life built not on the sandy soil of human accomplishment or employment or financial security or good looks or good grades, but upon the rock-solid love of Jesus, the Christ of God, the one who always loves us best. Amen. are coming forward to wait upon you for your tithes and offerings. We give to God because God's given us everything 
And one of the ways we worship him is by returning a portion of that to our local church so that more people can come to know Jesus through the ministries that we develop with that faithful giving. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this chance to be together and to remind us that all we have is because of you. So now, call to our minds, even if we don't know them personally, all those who will be touched by your goodness because of our faithfulness in these moments. And for that, we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the second book of the New Testament, the second Gospel. As we look at chapter 4, starting in verse 35, today we're going to look at a stormy account in Mark 4. It may be familiar to some of you. If it is not familiar to you today, that's okay. We'll just, we'll just understand it together. Let's pray. Lord, so we come before you today with so many things to be grateful for. And as we recall them in our mind, we are blessed for the privilege of coming to worship you in this place. That we, the church, gather together in this place to give you honor and praise. Remind us again today that as your people, when we hear from your scriptures, you are speaking to us. So don't let anything get in the way of that. Thank you for the chance to lift up prayers in song, to bow our heads in prayer, to be in fellowship one with another, to celebrate a new life coming into our church family. Thank you for all those things. Thank you for your word. And may we know you more because we were here today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this account has to do with Jesus' power. And since the passage refers to his calming a storm, and the power of nature was the most awesome and feared things to people in the first century, and pretty much to us as well, right? Have you ever been around when lightning struck close by? It's a pretty overwhelming kind of thing, isn't it? But we're talking today about Jesus' power over all things and what that means for us in this moment. So this is, this is what I'm getting at. If this passage is only about Jesus calming a storm on the Galilean lake, then this sermon will be short. He's powerful. He calmed it. Let's go home. But you're not going to be that lucky. One of the best ways to see all that God has for us is to take each part of the passage and see if it adds up to anything. Calming the storm is one part for sure, but is there more? I think there is. So listen to the account in Mark 4, beginning with verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. That's a really good question. So let's take a look at this. What we see in this passage, one, is in verse 36, and that Jesus is with the disciples before, everybody say before. Before. A little better than that. Before. Jesus is with the disciples before the storm. That's an important observation. Please note here that before there was any trouble on the SS disciple, before there was an inkling that anything might go awry, before there was a hint that the cool air from the Mediterranean Sea would be drawn through the narrow mountain passes and bump into the hot, humid air over the lake, creating furious squalls, before any of that Jesus is with them in the boat. He's already there. I wonder how aware you are of God's presence in your life. According to an old, old article in an old U.S. News and World Report, do you remember the days when we read magazines? Do you remember those days? Anyway, a number of years ago, those who call themselves Christians were surveyed and asked, in general, how often would you say you have experienced God's presence which felt close to you? 
10% replied never. These are Christians. 17% said once or twice. 23% said several times. 49% said regularly. So the best case scenario for Christians is that almost 50% of us feel that God is regularly present with us. Only 50%. Meaning, of course, 50% of us do not feel God's presence regularly. No wonder we live life with such uncertainty and then often experience such frustration. As believers, it seems, feeling God's presence with us is at best dependent on the flip of a coin. So how does that affect how we handle the family storm or the financial storm or the personal storm or the storm of uncertainty that makes us hope we're doing the right thing even though we're not really sure if we're ever doing the right thing? How do we ride out storms in life? First, we need to make sure that Jesus has been invited into our boat. Listen to verse 36. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, that is Jesus, just as he was in the boat. Jesus was there. They made preparations for him to be in the boat. They made sure he had a seat on the boat. They consciously brought him along and made room for him in the boat. They didn't know what they might need him for, but he was there in the boat. So as you go to work tomorrow, or the Golden Arches, or you drive up to the intersection of Route 37 and 166, thank you for the three of you who are with me there, have you made plans to take Jesus along, just as he is? You see, if, we, if you leave a, a seat for Jesus in your everyday life, it will radically transform your work day or your school day or your vacation day. And quite frankly, we all could use some transforming, couldn't we? Next, in verse 37, Jesus is with the disciples during, everybody say during. During, during the storm. We Christians have a tendency to switch to survival mode when a storm comes up and depend on our own power to get us through. So many people have said to me over the years, um, uh, I've been doing this for a while now as, as pastoring churches, and I've had so many people say to me, Pastor, I want to come back and get involved in your church as soon as I get my act together. As if Jesus plays no role in you getting your act together. It does, my friends. We assume the God role. Often the thing that makes us take on the God role is unexpected crisis. We might get through the trouble okay, but God never gets consulted because we're trying to operate as God. And in the midst of that crisis, nobody had the privilege to witness that we are followers of Jesus. And the way we get through the crisis isn't nearly as good as God wanted to guide us through. We have to remember that God has the ultimate power in, that rela in the relationship which we have with him. The late Tim Keller tells the following story about the power of Christ's resurrection. A pastor was in Italy, and there he saw the gravestone of a man who had died centuries before. The man was an unbeliever and completely against Christianity, but he was kind of a little afraid of it, too. So the man had a huge stone slab put over his grave so he would not have to be raised from the dead in case there was a resurrection of the dead, you know, in case God turned out to be right. He had insignias put all over the slab saying, I don't want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. However, when he was buried, an acorn must have fallen into the grave as well because now hundreds of years later, the acorn has grown up through the grave and split that slab in two as that acorn is now a towering oak tree. The minister looked at it and said, if an acorn, which has the power of biological life in it, can split a slab to that magnitude, what difficulty can the acorn of God's resurrection split wide open in a person's life? Keller goes on. The minute you decide to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. It's the power of the resurrection, the same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Think of the difficulties you see as immovable slabs in your life. 
your bitterness, your refusal to forgive that person, your insecurity, your fears, your self-doubts, those things can be split and rolled off. The more you know him, the more you grow into the power of the resurrection. And the more the power of the resurrection can defeat those things which always seem to be defeating you. You know, I've always thought of Jesus' disciples as the Keystone Cops. Any of you remember the Keystone Cops, right? Well-intentioned goose. I always picture them following Jesus down the dusty trails of Palestine in single file. And when Jesus would stop for a moment to think, they'd keep walking and just kind of bump into each other right back behind, just like the Keystone Cops would. And you know, we do the same kind of things today, except we know how the book ends already. We don't have as many excuses as the disciples had. Anyway, one thing they did here in this passage is also, when the storm came, they went and got Jesus. They knew he was in their boat. By the way, it takes a really good preacher to schedule a rainstorm during a sermon on storms. I'm just throwing that out there. Anyway, now they were still human. They panicked for sure. They were even accusing Jesus of being indifferent. You don't care if we drown. Which is what panicked people do in a crisis, don't they? They panic and they get a little mouthy. Like backseat drivers. You ever experienced a backseat driver? Are you a backseat driver? You can slow down here anytime you want. I don't really want to die today. But the disciples, in all of their human imperfection, the disciples, in their keystone cops practice, did job number one. They asked Jesus for help in the storm. I wonder what's your first gut reaction when trouble comes. Blame? Terror? Hopelessness? A mild acceptance of defeat? Bitterness? Denial? Maybe quitting? These Keystone Cop disciples, as silly as they often were in the pre-resurrection era, got this right. Their first reaction was to ask Jesus for help. They knew where their rescue would come from. They didn't have to guess or try to reinvent the wheel for a new method of coping. In a storm, they went to the one who could calm the sea even before they knew he could calm the sea. You've heard of the dog whisperer? The horse whisperer, the ghost whisperer, Jesus is the storm whisperer, actually the life whisperer. He was with them in the storm. They knew it. It affected what they did when they faced trouble because they asked him for help. You see, what you and I believe now about Jesus' presence or lack thereof in all of our storms of life will determine what we do when the waves crash over our bow. It is vital that we know what we believe about Jesus and his power before the wind starts blowing. Why? Because Jesus is with us in the storm. Next one. Jesus is with the disciples after. Everybody say after. After the storm is calm. Before, during, and after. When are the times we forget about God's active presence in our lives the most? Well, my experience tells me that it's before the storm hits and after the storm is calmed because there is no immediate crisis and we tend to just go about our normal autopilot routine. Think back to 2001. Did anyone ever think that we'd go back to our regular routines after the 9-11 attacks? Oh, can't be. It just can't ever happen. We'd never be the same. But we did, didn't we? And it didn't take that long either. I was serving a church over by Philadelphia at that time, and we had about 600 people who would come to worship on a regular Sunday, six or 700 people. And the Sunday after the Tuesday attacks, there were 1,400 people who came to worship seeking out God for, for, for protection and help and to understand what had happened. The following week, there were 1,000. The week after that, back to six or 700. It doesn't take too long to go back to our regular routine. Yet God wants us to carry the victory that we experience in him into every aspect of our life so we can trust him even more in the next turbulent episode. 
Eugene Peterson, the late Eugene Peterson, wrote a great book called The Unnecessary Pastor. I don't love the title, but it was a good book. He writes, my two sons are both rock climbers, and I've listened to them plan their ascents. They spend as much or more time planning their climbs as in the actual climbing. They meticulously plot their route, and then as they climb, put in what they call protection pitons, hammered into small crevices in the rock face. And then they attach ropes to those that will stop their descent, they will stop their fall if they slip. He writes, rock climbers who fail to use pitons have very short rock climbing careers. You know what I mean? He writes, in our faith, our pitons are when we hold on to those times we've experienced God's faithfulness in our lives. Every answered prayer, every victory, every storm that has been calmed by his presence is a piton which keeps us from falling or losing hope or worse yet, losing our faith. Every piton in our life is an example of God's faithfulness to us. As we ascend in the kingdom of God, we also realize that each experience, each victory is only a piton. That is a stepping stone toward our ultimate goal of finishing the race and receiving the crown of glory. So I believe it is very proper for us to look at this storm-calming event as Jesus giving them a piton to help the disciples and us climb higher in our faith. So what does that mean? Well, the storm is not the end of the journey is what it means. It's just an obstacle as the disciples go to minister in a new place. And where are they going? Well, back in verse 35, the whole reason for getting in the boat was because Jesus wanted to take those guys over to the other side. What's over there is the region of the Gerasenes. You see that in chapter 5, verse 1. This region is made, mostly, uh, made up mostly of non-Jews, people who were unlike the disciples. This is where Jesus casts out the legion of demons into the pigs, and the man experiences that healing and that deliverance. He heals this one guy. He casts out the demons, and then he goes back in the boat and returns to the other side from where he started. It's an awful lot of trouble for one guy. Is it? Or isn't it? As we see from the apostles in the future, Jesus' gospel is for everyone, not just the Jews or the religious people in general. And Jesus takes them to the Gerasene region to show him, to show him and all of them that his gospel is for everyone. And the calming of the storm... Well, if God calls you to a place, then he'll bring you through anything to get you to that place. Have you ever been through a storm? Because that may be an indicator it's time to minister and live your life in a new way. That is, God doesn't intend to deliver you from the trouble of the world as an end in itself. It's easy to think that. But rescue isn't the ultimate intention of God here. The intention was not for the disciples to go through the storm, have all that adrenaline pumping, see Jesus calm it, get saved from the storm, high-five each other, and then go back to the jug handle in and talk about it all night. No, the purpose of this whole event was for the disciples to use the calming of the storm as a piton in their lives, something that helps them get further and protects them from falling. The disciples could have well been thinking, God brought us through a lot to get us to the region of the Gerasenes. I wonder what he'll have us do next and to whom will bring us. It is in our human DNA to realize that when we come through difficulty or tragedy or trouble, that it just can't stop there. It should be shared. That's why people who don't even know God establish foundations and programs to help those who are dealing with the storm that they've just come through. That's how we were created by God. So we don't keep victory to ourselves. That's why there's MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. That's why there's the Heroes Project. That's why there are walks for cancer and golf tournaments to support research for heart disease. Because people want to help others who are going through the storm that they've come out of. The deliverance from the storm is not an end in itself. God wants you to use it for something else. For something greater. <coughs> so now, God's brought you or is bringing you, or will bring you through the storm. He does that. He's awesome. But because of that deliverance, in what new way does he want you to serve him now? 
That's the question he has for you when the storm is calm, because it doesn't end when there are glassy seas and blue skies. That's when it begins. So how will your deliverance lead to new ways, even new locations, of sharing God's love? After all, you didn't think your umbrella got ruined just so you could be happy about being dry, did you? There's more to it than that. Let's pray. So Lord, we come to you today and we are reminded that we live too much of our life without you in it. You may be there, but we don't consult you or lean on you or sometimes even acknowledge your presence. Please forgive us. Remind us that the disciples invited you into the boat, not even knowing they'd be here. Help us to do that. Every day when the alarm rings or when we wake up on our own, help us to invite you into the boat to calm our storms, carry us through trouble, and hold our hands for comfort. We don't have to live life alone. So Lord, we ask this day for you to come into our boat. And we'll thank you for all time in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to number 77, How Great Thou Art. And let's stand and worship God together. <laughs>
grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, the one who wants to be invited into our lives, into our boat. May that God be with you and me forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Amen.